Good afternoon. Um, I want to thank the uh, organization for inviting me, um, particularly uh, Trisha uh, Caruana and also Dr. Malcolm Stewart, who actually suggested me to come and uh, give this talk. So thank you. Um, it's my first time here, and I'm very um, humbled and uh, honored to be here to talk in front of you all. This is a very um, interactive session, so please do interrupt me anytime if you feel like having questions. This is really a talk for patients and caregivers, so um, it, I want you to get the most out of it. If you have any burning questions, just go ahead. It's you know not a formal dogmatic talk where you just listen and, and I just uh, give a talk, but be inter as interactive as you want. It's really a talk for you to get the most out of it. Um, I was asked to talk about advanced uh, problems of atypical Parkinsonism, and I know it's very dear to many patients who are in that stage and want some answers. Um, I have structured the talk in three parts. For one, I'll start talking about um, comparing the main forms of atypical Parkinsonism, MSA, uh, cortical basal generation, and uh, PSP. And then I'll talk about sort of the professional view of how we think about disease progression. I was told that you all have a lot of questions about understanding what markers perhaps are of advanced disease and how diseases progress. I'll give you a flavor of what I and my colleagues think of how we conceptualize disease progression. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, the issues of management and problems of advanced disease. And then I'll finish up with giving you some out outlines or highlights of different aspects of um, research progress and research ideas to hopefully come up with better cures, at least better treatments for those diseases. Um, and I'll also, I'll, short of lying down, I think I will also be mimicking or doing some things visually so make it really easy for you to understand some of the things that are on the slides, okay? Um, so, there we go. Um, basically, atypical Parkinsonism is a group of diseases that are neurodegenerative in nature. That means they're slowly progressive and unfortunately get worse over time. Um, and they mimic Parkinson's disease. So um, they have, unfortunately, as we all know, decreased life expectancy. Um, they have the classic Parkinsonian features, which are tremor, like shaking, uh, rigidity, stiffness, um, postural instability, imbalance and bradykinesia, which is basically slowness of movement. But they are atypical in their features, and that's why they're not Parkinson's disease. There's something funny about those features that make them uh, group into a disease category of atypical Parkinsonism. So for example, we don't have the classic resting tremor often that we see in Parkinson's disease. They're often irregular tremors. They come out when, when the people have action. Um, they have early postural instability Classically, as you all know, PSP patients fall very early in the disease, which is atypical. They also, in some forms, have early dementia. Um, and they have symptoms outside the motor system, um, which are uh, sometimes helpful to make a distinction between Parkinson's disease and atypical Parkinsonism. And also, as we all also know, is that over time, unfortunately, they don't respond to the classic dopaminergic drugs as Parkinson's disease would. Um, here's a table, and I thought about how to present this to you. Uh, I was asked to basically uh, compare these three diseases, MSA, cortical based generation, and PSP. And rather than explaining all three in sequence, I thought I'd give you a table so you can see the issues right in front of you visually and compare right away the different aspects of disease. So we discussed some of it this morning already, but I'll just run through very quickly. Uh, oops, for MSA, See if this, I'm not pointing directly here. Anyhow, for, MS, oh, for MSA here is the anatomic, uh, most importantly, we have a problem with the autonomic nervous system, and we have symptoms that are very profound in this department. And this combined with either problems of the cerebellum, which defines the disease as MSA, or we have autonomic uh, nervous system problems when they are combined with basal ganglia problems, we get MSAP for Parkinsonism. So what I mean by that is the autonomic dysfunction are very critical in MSA, and what people suffer from is profound um, orthostatic, orthostasis or orthostatic hypotension, which basically means when you change position, you go from lying to standing or from sitting to standing, you become very dizzy and faint, and you have all these fainting spells. And there are criteria in the medical field for how much the blood pressure needs to drop to really 
get this definition of MS. It's much, much worse than other diseases. And that's a huge problem. The other problem is that of urinary symptoms, particularly urinary incontinence. It's not enough in MSA to be uh, having urinary urgencies or retention, but you really have incontinence, and that's independent of being able to move or not. So the patient really has to, as I say, pee in his pants. Even though he can walk perfectly, he cannot control that, and that's very important. It's very atypical and very characteristic of MSA. The other thing that's characteristic is for men who have uh, uh, MSA is that they essentially all are erectile dysfunction. Um, it's barely no. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's it's rare that they don't have that, and it actually precedes many, many years before the full-blown symptoms. That does not mean that every person who has erectile dysfunction will develop this, but the patients who do have those symptoms very early in life. And those are critical features of the autonomous, autonomic uh, nervous system dysfunction that define MSA. And then in addition to that, you either, as mentioned, you have cerebellar symptoms, so people have imbalance. It is quite different from the Parkinsonian gait that we all know. It's more like really wide-based, uncontrolled, not unidirectional, and it really looks like someone who's drunk. Um, it's a very particular way of falling and having imbalance. Um, they also have what we call limitaxia, so they over or undershoot their movements, and that actually happens in all kinds of level of motor programming. So in speech, they won't have a fluid tone or intonation to go up and down, they over and undershoot, or they will completely be monotonous. Uh, and when they reach for a target, they will also over or under reach for a target. They will go like this when they stretch out their arms. Um, the same thing happens with their eyes when they scan something. If there's a bird flying, they want, or you have to track to this particular point, they'll overshoot or they'll undershoot. And that particular gate attacks, so this, this over undershoot, which we call dysmetria, is present in all kinds of aspects of their motor uh, function, motor system. Um, or as we mentioned, she had, they have MSAP, where we have the atypical Parkinsonian features in addition to the autonomous nervous system. So this is defines MSA. Quite differently, it is in PSP um, that we have there as a foundation the problem of eyes and gait. With the eyes, we have the problem that uh, these patients have eventually a real problem looking downwards, and that's very important for the diagnosis. And what they also have are other subtleties. I'll just mention two of them. When they have to scan the visual field, they want smoothly targeted vision. They'll go very choppy. And that can be seen in horizontal gaze. And what is also of interest is they have eyelid opening or eyelid closing apraxia. That means they're unable to open their eyes or unable to close their eyes. So classically, you ask them if they can close their eyes, and then they can. And you ask them to open them again, and they have to really pry their, their eyes up to be able to open and see, and then they can close them actively, but they can't open them. And this is kind of a dystonic problem, which is very successfully treated with uh, Botox, actually. And in addition to the eye problems, they have gait problems, and as we all know, they have early gait problems, very early gait problems, and they're classically axial, which means they really fall like a log. I mean, if you have been to the doctor and they have pulled you on a pull test, which most movements or specialists do, they really fall like a log. There's no correction of gait at all. And the other thing is they have this gunslinger walk, where they basically walk a little bit wide base, and they don't have their arms swing, and it looks like John Wayne having his, his uh, hands in a, in a pocket wanting to shoot. That's where the, the, the name gunslinger sign comes from. These are the classic descriptive patterns of gait. Um, anyhow, so that defines PSP. And then cortical basal generation is different as the name says. It's cortex, high, higher function, and basal for basal ganglia, again, could be Parkinson or dystonia or myoclonus or tremor. From the cortical dysfunction, we already heard a little bit about this morning, but for those of you who have, may not have been there this morning, a typical aspect is that it's mostly unilateral, and then if they have the cortical dysfunctions, they have language problems, and a particular type of language problem, which is mentioned here as PPNA, uh, primary progressive non-fluent aphasia, which basically means that the patient over time stops talking. The production of language decreases over time, and they have uh, tremendous problems. The, the structure of the grammar goes slower. They speak, start speaking like children, like one or two words per sentence, and they get very frustrated because they want to say something, but it doesn't come out as language. It's not a speech problem, and that's very frustrating uh, to the patient. Um, we talked about the alien limb phenomenon. Basically, we have a limb that is 
does whatever it wants to. It has utilization behavior. It starts picking on things. And the patient's often not aware of it. They'll ask, you'll ask the patient, say, which is the right, left arm is normal. They're like, who does it belong to? He said, this is my left arm. And if you ask about that left, the right arm that's flinging around, he would probably say, oh, this is your arm, doctor. So they won't even recognize sometimes that that arm, it is so alien, it's not even belonging to them. And that's a very interesting neurological problem but unfortunate for the patient because it's very hard to control and very difficult to treat. Um, uh, moving on now, I'm going to talk about a few clinical pearls which help you in addition to these fundamental um, definition, defining clinical patterns to maybe help to see which category the disease belongs to. So interesting part is for apraxia of speech, which is basically a speech disorder where um, you're unable, you basically correct yourself when you um, try to spell a word. You'll say apple, apple, apple. Apple. So you, it sounds like someone's really trying to teach himself the words. And um, that's one way to describe it. It's a complex cortical problem. And what has been found is it's actually present in both diseases, PSP and CBD. But if it's only available in the beginning, many people start thinking this will actually develop into PSP. So that case is where they start really with apraxia of speech. And then uh, people, if they're purely apraxia of speech, they then develop actually PSP and not CBD. Um, I'm going to go on and just show some kind of red flags for certain diseases. So in MSA, we have a lot of dystonic problems. We have what's called the tilted trunk or the PISA sign. You literally are bent over like this because you have a dystonic contraction of one side. and You look like the Tower of Pisa. Or you have camptoconia when you're completely bent over, but really strongly bent over because your whole trunk pulls forward. Again, it's thought to be potentially a dystonia of the anterior muscles. And it's very, very difficult to treat and very discomforting to the patient. Um, other things that I might mention here quickly is the whole idea here in MSA where you have problems of voice, phonation, and sleep, and uh, um, uh, breathing. So aphonia, basically, you basically start whispering and completely lose your voice. Um, strider is something like when you insp insp uh, when you um, breathe in air, then you have these wheezing sounds, like at, at night people will say <laughs> <laughs> that kind of stuff. And it's very dangerous because people, you can imagine, they can basically um, potentially die because of uh, having a, a complete a disruption of airflow and ensuing arith arrhythmias, cardiac arrhythmias. Um, um, the other thing that people of, often, often see with MSA is this particular inspiratory sigh. They go, and these kind of sounds, sometimes as, as random as they sound, can help to really move a diagnosis in one way or the other. Um, also, REM sleep behavioral disorders, RBD, um, basically, um, as many of you also possibly know, uh, at middle of the night, patients act out their dreams. They're still sleeping. They don't remember a thing, but they act out the dream. The person who remembers is the spouse who gets hit in the face and comes to the doctor and says, doctor, we have a problem at home, and the patient has no idea what happened. And so it's like uh, something that is actually very early in this disease of MSA um, and very characteristic. Um, and so these are warning signs. Uh, I wouldn't call these early disease markers, but it's interesting to me over the years to see that all these motor function diseases, we always think about them as Parkinsonism and problem with movement, have a lot of non-movement issues that actually happen very early on, and I think over the years we'll probably redefine those diseases and have a better sense of what comes first and what's come later. Same with smell. I mean, uh, smell has become more interesting also in the Parkinson research area because loss of smell has been one of the early signs as well. Um, okay, other things that I, I find interesting, for example, the neck position. If you have a neck that is bend forward, which we call anticollis, is often seen in MSA. If it's backwards, retrocollis is often seen in PSP. Different kind of neck positions may help to distinguish. The other thing is um, frontal lobe dementia. So both diseases, PSP and CBD, which are quite similar pathogenically, uh, which I'll show you a little later, um, have this problem of frontal lobe uh, cognitive decline. And they all have this typical compulsion, depression, irritability complex. Um, in PSP, they have particularly apathy. It's like a patient who basically all the air is taken out of his tire. He has no motivation whatsoever. He stares. He doesn't want to do anything. That's uh, somewhat that's more often seen in PSP. Uh, what you also see is like um, 
um, the clap sign. You asked him to clap three times, and he would clap like 10 times. He wouldn't be able to stop that, sort of a disinhibition sign. Same as uh, the rocket sign. We just talked about how to get out of a chair. Uh, and the PSP patient, if you ask them to get out of a chair and they still can, they'll jump out. I mean, they literally jump out and jump into you because they can't control to be very slow. And it's sort of a reflection of a disinhibition that the brakes are off in many ways, in behavior as well. That's why they're aggressive or irritable. So the frontal lobe is important for putting the brakes on behavior. And when that's gone, um, then these things come out more, more aggressively. Okay. I'll move on to the final slide of the differentiation. Just to mention, um, hand and feet contractures and emotional incontinence is also seen often in MSA. Emotional incontinence is someone who cries for no reason or who laughs for no reason or who laughs when everybody else cries or who cries when anybody else laughs. There's no emotional context to the expression. Um, and uh, I'll skip... Uh, the exact uh, treatment options, because I'll mention them later. We know that we try to use Cinemet or other dopaminergic medication for the motor symptoms, but then we also try to use uh, other medications for the non-motor symptoms. Uh, just to mention, maybe, since we do are talking about it, um, let me see, I can't find it, the pointer. Zolpidem has actually been shown in a few patients uh, to help with eye movements. It's a drug that uh, uh, facilitates GABAergic transmission. Amantadine has been shown in some patients to help with gait. So we don't just give up with cinema. We have some other drugs we try, at least in the motor realm, to help. Um, and uh, DBS PPN, we talked about that a little bit earlier. I actually was trained in Toronto, and we had a couple of patients. We actually did that uh, in the trial there. Okay, having PP, uh, uh, PPN, which is the pedunculoponta nucleus. We did DBS surgery on those patients. And some of them did better and some of them didn't. So overall, in the literature, we don't have a significant improvement, but we have a few patients who got better on it. Um, and the question is, you know, is it enough? But uh, it's a hit or miss thing. But there was a lot of excitement in the beginning because it's a good target in the brainstem, which is thought to be important for gait function, particularly axial stability. Um, and then while prog acid and lithium, I'd like to mention for those who have PSP, um, lithium apparently has not been proven now uh, to be helpful, but these are drugs which inhibit mechanistically uh, in protein that is involved in the pathogenesis potentially of PSP. And we'll get to that in, this, in, in later. Okay, so um, the, the next slides are just slides sort of visually to get you a little bit more uh, a flavor of the diseases um, where pathology and imaging actually helps also in addition to clinical judgment whether or not a patient has one of these uh, atypical Parkinsonistic diseases. Um, so the hummingbird sign is something that's often shown. Oops. And you can see at the error here, this is like a beak of a bird if you are creative enough. I do think this is a head and you can sort of see the hummingbird. And the Normally that structure here is much thicker, so you would not see it as a beak, but here you see it very thin, and it basically indicates atrophy of the midbrain and comes up with a hummingbird sign. So if you have signs like that on MRI and you catch them, that truly is helpful. It doesn't define the disease, but it's another layer of support for a clinician to say, I have these features in this, and I have an MRI which shows it. So you know, I'm more and more comfortable with the idea of this being a disease A, B, or C. Um, the next slide shows pathology. Just wanted to show you another uh, aspect of it. So an MSA, this is a substantia nigra here with the black stripes in a normal patient control. And you see it's almost all gone over here in MSAP for Parkinsonism. And here's MSAC, so this is a whole brain. And here's the cerebellum. That's the part of the brain that runs those sim uh, uh, functions that are disrupted in MSAC. And that's really melted that's really melted away over here. And also the, the pawns, the brainstem part here, you see these big pillars here, they're completely gone. So you have atrophy of the pawns in the cerebellum, and if you have those features gone, then it is helpful for the diagnosis of MSAC, okay? So pathology and imaging supports um, these uh, clinical uh, definitions of diseases. And again, in the field of movement disorders, everything is still very clinical. We don't have good markers, we don't have a blood pressure value that's high to say you have higher blood pressure. We don't have a sugar value to say this is diabetes. We don't have that target yet. So we very much rely on 
many little things that are put together, middle pieces to, to fill the puzzle of making diagnosis. And often what I've learned from my uh, mentors is you don't make a diagnosis on the first visit. You watch the patient, you follow them, you'll get burned because the more you see, you'll realize patients are very individual and uh, you make mistakes. You just wait and see and follow them and give a diagnosis. Um, Okay, this is the last one of those uh, images I wanted to show you in relation to these um, different diseases, um, cortical basal degeneration, and it shows actually disease progression. The first two panels, the first panel here up there shows in 2004 a drain pain, and you see a little bit asymmetry. You see more holes, more space on the left side than here. You may say, hmm, it could be asymmetric, could just be a coincidental, but then in 2007, I believe it says here, you see much more here. It's really melting away and it's unilateral, and that sort of helps to define the disease. So in this patient, the right arm possibly would be very much affected. He would have maybe an alien limb, or he would have dystonia on the right side, and if you see that with this image, you kind of put things together and say this could be cortical basal degeneration. This patient may have aphasia as well because of the left side of the brain and so forth. And this is also very instructive, I think, if you look at the PET scanning. Um, here, blue is low activity, and then red is high activity. You see the whole part of the left brain inside here is blue, which means there's a much less metabolic activity. That helps you to say that this thing is not, this part is not really working as well. And also in the basal ganglia, you see the red stripe here on the right side. It's completely gone on the left. That means the left basal ganglia is also not working. That's a classic description of left-sided corticobasal degeneration. Okay, so moving on to the concept of disease progression. And I'll just explain to you how I think about the diseases. Um, every disease is very specific. And they're made up of different symptoms that together defines a syndrome. So you have MSA with, say, symptoms 1, 2, 3, 4, and that becomes MSA. You have PSP with the symptoms 5, 6, 7, 8, and that becomes uh, disease uh, B. And Correlated with those particular symptoms, you have specific areas of the brain that degenerate. So in MSAC, you'll have the cerebellum and the, ponta, and the ponta nuclei. In uh, PSP, you'll have the midbrain and the frontal lobe. So what it means is you have a particular fingerprint of symptoms in each disease that correlates with a specific fingerprint of affected brain areas. And those brain areas they degenerate more and more and more, and so you get more severe symptoms on each part, in each category. And the problem really is, if you have five or six patients who come to you for the first time, they may present very differently. Because if the disease is defined as symptoms A, B, C, D, patient A may only have A, and then the second patient only has symptoms C, and the third only has D. But over the years, they all come together with that particular fingerprint. So one has to be careful because sometimes, you know, the same disease can present initially with different parts of the disease until the whole disease evolves because for some reason, say, in, in the patient with PSP, one patient, uh, the front lobe is more involved first and then the other structures come in the other patient. The midbrain is involved first, so he'll have more eye problems first. So. That's how we envisionalize the fingerprinting of symptoms correlating to fingerprinting of the affected brain areas. And the real problem really is in research now, not only to understand um, the reason why cells die, but it's really complex in the sense what we really have to understand is why those do these cells die in those particular areas? Why is it that in MSA it dies in brain area one and two? And why is it that in PSP it dies in three and four? It's not only understanding why a cell dies, but why are certain areas spared and why are not? So it's all the issue about selectivity and vulnerability, and that is a really complex issue. And if I may expand on that, I think we really need to understand the cell selectivity issue before we have really good grasp on good treatment. And that's a really challenging problem in neurology, throughout neurology, not just in the movement disorders. This is a uh, uh, slide which basically shows you the fingerprint idea. This is a cortical basal degeneration type of uh, patient um, over the years. And everything that's in red is affected brain. And you can see two things. It's a particular pattern. And number two, you can see the whole brain, the 
its involvement throughout the entire brain. So what I want you to be aware of, and what's always forgotten, particularly in the medical books, Parkinson's disease, PSP, MSA, these are not just isolated diseases. All these diseases affect the entire brain in different ways, in different patterns, different fingerprints, but they affect the entire brain. And so if you're advanced, as you will see, and you know from personal experience, um, the motor symptoms do not become the primary problem. It's other things. And that's when you really realize the disease is not just the shaking or the stiffness. It's really much, much more than that. Um, okay, we kind of talked about this already, the idea that currently we're looking at the cell death and why cells die in those particular areas, but the real challenging question will be, after we know that, to understand selectivity and vulnerability, to understand the pattern, the fingerprint of the individual diseases. Um, and I'll talk to you about a little bit about um, the individual cell death pack mechanisms to give you a flavor of not only having the symptoms and the structural changes, but also understanding what happens in those areas for you to have a you know better grasp on the disease. So for once, um, what is interesting is on a cell level, you have specific cell changes. And MSA is a disease of alpha-synuclein. Um, that's what we think. And so there's something going wrong, and these alpha-synuclein molecules start clumping up, and they start clumping up in a cell type called oligodendrocyte. This is a specific uh, cell in the uh, central nervous system that is important for myelination and basically allows the neurons to talk quicker to each other. And so when you see alpha-synuclein clumps in the oligodendrocyte, that's extremely helpful for the diagnosis of MSA. And actually it finds it uh, categorically as being MSA on, on autopsy. Um, in contrast, Ch cell changes in PSP and, and CBD are different. These diseases are very closely related. So um, they're both tauopathies. We talked about this earlier this morning. There are four repeat tauopathies. And they have clumps of not alpha-synuclein, but of tau in their, in, their in their cells. And they have different types of clumps in different cell types. And so the pathologist can somewhat differentiate between PSP and cortical basal degeneration based on the pattern of tau and how it looks under the microscope. So both diseases have the same protein clumped out or aggregated, but they look differently as to where the clumps are in which compartment of the cell and which cell type. That's basically what I want to come across here. They have tufts, for example, that in astrocytes, we have both clumps in PSP and CBD, but in astrocytes, it's proximal, it's called tuft, they have a different structure, and in the CBD, there would be plaques and a distal structure. So there are subtleties which help the pathologist to help them with differentiating between one another. And obviously, also, the areas which are affected are different in both diseases. This structural fingerprint I talked about. I'll give you some pictures here just to give you an idea and visualize it for you. Um, so on the left side, you have balloon neurons. The lower part shows a blown up neuron, and here around this blown up neuron, you see that this uh, layer of aggregated tau. Same here, you have different structures. This is cortical basal bodies. They're just, just descriptive, and you see how they look on microscope. If you go on, there's two more uh, structures. You have these threads. It looks really like threads of tau deposition in neurons and glial cells. And on the slide here, this is an astrocytic plaque. And here you have a coiled body. See this coiled round thing there. And that's how the pathologists under, under the microscope then look at these diseases. So if someone basically uh, donates their brain, if, uh, then you would basically look at those structures and find in the particular areas those structures and then to find a disease and say, aha, we really think it was clinically corticobasal, but pathology confirms it. And often that's not the case. I mean, there are interesting studies where they have clinical doctors basically say clinically what it is, and there are some discrepancies after actually autopsy, which tells you that these cell, uh, movements orders can somewhat be very overlapping. And I think we had a slide this morning which uh, attested to that particular PSP, frontal temporal dementia, quarter bit generation, and so forth. So it's not really like a black and white thing, and often patients won't have an answer right away. It's not that easy because it's a very complex um, collection of diseases. And the, the, the field is really uh, in flux about definition and redefining uh, diseases like that. We wish it would be easier. Um, okay, in terms of cellular mechanisms, now that I've talked about 
which areas are affected, and how it looks under the microscope. I'd like to talk a few minutes about what actually happens, what we think happens. And in terms of PSP and cortical-based generations, which are the tauropathies I mentioned, I'll simplify in saying that we have basically pillars of microtubuli that are important for cell structure, but also very important for providing a scaffold for transport of important stuff from which goes from cell compartment to cell compartment. And the red part is the tau protein, which basically stabilizes this pillar and allows these cargo to go back and forth. And you can imagine if somehow this process gets interrupted by modification of the tau protein, we call this hyperphosphorylation, for example, then these proteins will not attach anymore, and so the whole pillar will dissemble. If the whole like cylinder dissembles, obviously transport cannot occur and cell structure is disrupted. And so when this whole picture shifts from the left, say the benign condition to a, a disease condition, you can imagine that this creates a lot of havoc in the cell and then it leads to cell death and then you see all these clumps of tau that I showed you before in different compartments of the cell. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a vision of what actually happens in the brain. And it's not understood why these proteins then actually clump up, but when they clump up, there's evidence that they might be toxic themselves. So not only is this cell uh, dying or dysfunctional because it doesn't have these structures anymore, but these clumps additionally cause havoc in the cell. So that's how we think about, um, very simplified of course, uh, what happens in PSPs and, cor and cortical-based generation. In contrast to that, the MSAs that I mentioned are is this alpha synucleinopathy. And I mentioned also earlier that basically of the position of alpha synuclein in this cell called oligodendrocyte. The interesting part though is that when you look at the brain, millions of neurons, proper nerve cells are also missing. So the real challenge is, while this helps us to define MSA, we don't know why death of these cells or dysfunction of these cells leads to millions of neurons dying. So what's the effect from here to here? And there's a lot of theories out there. I'll just mention two or three of them. Basically, the thing, if there is a stress and these cells are dying, then the immune system gets activated and, and they have um, secretion of inflammatory factors, which might actually then stress secondarily the neuron and the neuron dies as a consequence of that. Other people think that maybe if this cell type is lost, it doesn't protect the neuron as much anymore, and so the neuron is more vulnerable to oxidative stress and other stressors and dies because of that. Um, but the idea is, what is really not understood is, while we know that a lot of pathology happens in the oligodendrocyte, it is not clear why all the neurons die. And that gets back again to the idea that all these diseases really affect all cell types, which makes it complicated to research on, and I'll talk about it in a second as well. Um, okay, so um, we, now I would like to shift gear a little bit and talk about the challenges of advanced disease, and feel free if you have any questions to ask. Um, there's no clear marker of disease. I get this all the time. I wish I knew, um, and wish we knew as a community, but there are no real markers. What I find helpful is for the patients when they want to know, am I having a mild disease or, or an advanced disease? Some of the things that I find helpful are the following points. So number one is if the motor function ceases to respond to treatment. We have a patient who does well on cinnamon, and after six, seven, eight months, a year, he says, doctor, it doesn't work anymore. And we have doubled and tripled the dose, but it just doesn't do it anymore. And that's where you think about, you know, it's getting to the more advanced stages. Um, another point is you look at function. Um, you know, can you communicate with your spouse or significant other as social interactions? Do you go to your poker games? Do you go to your, do you take your wife to a concert? Is that working anymore? We're not going out any much anymore. We, I don't want to go to a restaurant anymore because I, it, it takes so much time. I'm so tired after that. It's such an ordeal. Those functional statements are very, very helpful to distinguish between mild, moderate, and severe, I think. Um, also mobility. Um, and what I also feel is um, it's really patient-driven. If you guys realize that the disease is affecting the entire body, that's when uh, you know it hits you, and you can think about this being more an advanced um, disease, particularly. Excuse me. Particularly when the non-motor functions receive much more attention. Most research is really based 
if you think about it, most research is based on the motor functions. We are all looking for drugs that help us to move better. But in advanced diseases, I personally think what I've seen from many patients, they don't even talk about their shaking or stiffness anymore. They say, I can't think. My wife complains all the time. I'm very, very irritated and very agitated. I've lost personality. Doctor, I don't recognize my spouse anymore. It's a different person. Um, behavior, cognition, um, and then GI tract, constipation. These basic functions become such a big problem in, in the disease. You're near sleep, can't sleep anymore, sleeps all day. Um, you know, drooling, terrible pain. Um, it can go on and on. And then the medications actually interfere with the motor function improvement. So suddenly cinnamon causes hallucinations, which has never happened before. Tells you the patient is clearly having progressive cognitive decline. Because if you give dopamine to a normal person, he doesn't hallucinate. But if you give it to someone who has dementia or cognitive decline, they do. So one, the patient says, it, I used to take it without any problems. Now I'm seeing things. You know there's a lot of other stuff going on that defines it as more advanced disease, which gets back to the hypothesis of the fingerprinting, the other areas sort of getting involved. I saw a question there. Yeah, we Please. Yeah, how, the question was for everybody, if I correctly understood, how many years into the disease are you when you have this? There is no real number. Um, every disease has their own progression, PSP, corticobasal, MSA. However, every patient within the disease is also different. So it's really hard. I've seen PSP patients who have lived for 20 years, and we have questioned the disease over and over and over again, but they were classic. We don't know why. Well, I've seen PSP patients who died within two years. And we don't know. If you put them together on day one, I have no idea why this person takes 10 years and this patient takes two years. I have no idea, I'll be very honest, when things happen. There are some graphs out there. I'm sorry I didn't put that slide in. There is a slide I have. I may have time. I'll find it on the computer, which outlines in blocks when what happens. It has been tried in trials. What seems to be the case is in some cases that the progression is at a certain rate and in the end it gets much faster. And so in the last part of the disease, much, much more symptoms come together. It kind of is like, it's going like, yeah, if I can visualize it, maybe like this and then like that. That's part of the thought process. There are a lot of theories out there, but it seems in, in, in some way that a lot of stuff clusters at the end. It's like the brain really tries to compensate and compensate and compensate. At some point, it crashes. And that's part of what I think philosophically about diseases in general. If you look at diabetes, it takes 90% of the pancreas to die before you get diabetes. So there is a lot of capacity, but when you get it and the compensation is gone, then really things happen fast. I think that might be somewhat an answer to your question. Okay, we're thinking, I mean, roughly, I'll say between three and eight years. But I mean, it's, it's large, you know, life expectancy varies along in MSA and PSP, corticobasal, could be five years, 10 years, you know, so, yeah. And I think it has to do, what I also tell patients, it made me think about something, if they say, what am I gonna expect in the future? I always say, look at your individual rate of progression. You know yourself now for three years with PSP or with MSA and you know what happened in the last three years, just extrapolate it out. So if you have a certain sense of how the slope is of progression, just continue that. But again, I said at the end, people think it goes much faster. Now when the end happens, I don't know either. So I know it's probably not the most satisfactory answer, but we have to be honest as medical professionals to tell you when we don't have a clear answer. Okay, all right, so, um, Okay, next slide. This is now sort of medical management about all these problems, and I think at that point, please interrupt me if you have any questions that concerns you specifically, because I'm sure that people go through this every single day, but I'm gonna tell you right now. Um, orthostatic hypotension MSA will be treated with compression stockings. Um, I have found it very helpful if patients are on a 30 per degree angle in bed and slept upright. There's some medical theory behind it that the radiant androgen tendons and system of the kidney gets activated. It helps 
maintaining blood pressure throughout the day. So what we did in Toronto when I was uh, learning, um, we had encouraged the patients to sleep in 30 degrees uh, to avoid uh, these uh, fainting spells when they change their position. Um, salt tablets, fluids, and then fludocortisone, mitodrine, uh, not in the evenings because it gives you tremendous blood, high blood pressure at night, which can be quite dangerous. And then sometimes even octreotide, which is interesting. Some people really collapse after they eat food. Um, and so um, apparently that uh, has an effect on the gut to have uh, decreased motility, decreased absorption, and then decreased autonomic dysfunction because of that. Urinary symptoms, um, um, you know, the classically anticholinergics, um, oxybutynin and tolteridone is usually what is used. Or what I found very interesting, if people have to pee all night, we give them desmopressin, which is a, a, an analog to the uh, endogenous hormone ADH. What it does, it, it basically tells the kidney to resorb all the water. So we ask them to pee as much as they can before they go to sleep, give them the desmopressin, and then basically it avoids them of avoiding. And so they... The benefit is not that they don't pee anymore. The benefit is that they sleep much better because they don't get up every day. So that we have tried that in some cases very successfully. But it requires a lot of effort between doctor and patient. This is not easy. And uh, uh, it requires a lot of uh, you know, tinkering and a lot of patience. Um, um, retention, you, you guys probably know, uh, intermittent self characterization and if it doesn't work, then even permanent with lots of complications, unfortunately, including infections. Jeweling, I found very, I'm very aggressive with jeweling with Botox. We tried atropin drops on the tongue, but when they really start to jewel, mostly it's because of an inability to swallow. It's a real problem. I've had people come in the office with like handkerchiefs and like every two minutes trying to control their jeweling. You just inject it in the uh, Botox in the parotid gland and it really helps. Um, that's when you really uh, make a difference, I think. Yeah. I get your microphone. Pardon? Does ENT do that or do you do the Oh, I do it myself. It's very, it's very straightforward. Thanks. Yeah. I, I inject myself. Uh, no, I inject the patient, not myself. Yeah. I inject myself and the patient stops drooling. That's good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's a new one. Okay. So next, uh, erectile dysfunction. Um, for MSA men, it's a real problem, but the problem is that the drugs which are helpful can be very dangerous. Like the uh, Viagra type of class of drugs have a side effect of hypotension, and these people are already fainting when they get up. So this can be very challenging, I just wanted to mention that. Um, and you know, the other things I mentioned over here um, in drastic cases, depending on quality of life, a lot of things can be done. Pain is a huge problem in advanced disease. Yeah. Um, I have a question back with the um, Botox and the parotid glands. Do you also do the salivary, all the salivary glands as well? You can, but I found they're so small. When it drools, you go to the big, the big waterfall. And that's the parotid gland. And how long does the uh, how long does it last for each patient? Yeah, depends between six and twelve weeks. And if it's not lasting that long, could we use? like Robinol or, or an anticholinergic in addition? With yes, that? absolutely. So I never do just that. I mean, mostly I try, I try atropine, it worked, um, and you can continue that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. It's often not sufficient. Okay. Particularly in MSA patients, I've found they just drool. And because their mouth is open, they can't close it. They have dystonias. Um, they have facial dystonias. So a lot of patients, it's very interesting uh, observation, actually that if you give MSA patients dopamine, you know in Parkinson's they get all these uh, uh, dyskinesias, they start doing this like Michael J. Fox. But in MSA they have dystonia facial contractions and they come out, nobody knows why you get facial contraction with that drug. It's something specific about MSA. So um, at that point, you know, they or have their mouth open like this and it just drools, okay? Um, yeah. So pain is a huge problem, completely underestimated and undertreated in these patients. Um, physical therapy is essential. Um, opiates gets dependent. Uh, it is helpful, but has lots of side effects. Botox I, it's good for dystonic pain, like M CBD patients, arm like this. You're not going to help to make them regain their function of their hand, but they can sleep and they are so happy they don't have this pain every single day. Um, people who have contractures in MS data like this, you open their fingers, you avoid terrible 
um, wounds or uh, um, uh, wound problems in their fist. I mean, they have seen ulcers in there because they go like this and nobody can clean it. And so if you open them up, at least you don't get infections, you don't get, you can have hygiene. So we're not trying to regain function here of an arm as much as we want to, but we can provide um, dignity of life and quality of life. And I think we should be as aggressive about that as we are about kind of treating disease. Um, the next thing is, um, yeah, we talked about the other things in the previous uh, talk. Um, Let's go. Yes, a couple of things. Um, Antrocolis has been tried with Botox. I, I think it's not the best idea because you induce severe dysphagia. And it's very risky, and I, I'm staying away from it. Um, let's see. Tracheostomy in sleep I find interesting. People in MSA potentially have sudden death at night because they go and then they stop breathing and have arrhythmias. You may want to do tracheostomy for someone. A CPAP helps a lot with uh, obstructive sleep apnea and the surgery we talked about. Um, and then I would like to emphasize a holistic approach. I think this is really important. I've learned a lot in Toronto where we have a, really a world-class palliative care center uh, run by Dr. Janice Miyazaki, um, where it is really separate from the uh, movement disorder general follow-up clinic. So I see MSA patients or PSP patients in regular medical follow-up. And then Dr. Miyazaki from the entire group was seeing patients, the same patients, on a different visit for all the other issues. And the other issues are advanced problems. It's not about, let's tinker with cinnamon, uh-huh, how are you doing, and that kind of things. But like, how is your family doing? Um, how is your wife doing? Has she had a vacation last week? She's stressed out for like two months. Has anybody taken care of her? Those kind of issues. Um, how are your children do dealing with this? How is the family coping with it? What did you install a handbar in the shower? Uh, what are you? Uh, is the wheel size correct on your wheelchair? That kind of things. And it's a lot about really um, therapy and uh, interaction with the family. I mean, someone said that yesterday. I think it was the, the Rainwater family that you know, if someone's sick, the whole family is involved, and it's it's really a, a major, major change in life of many people that needs to be respected and addressed. Um, we found peg tube feeding pretty effective. People are so scared about it because you think you take their dignity away. I think it really helps if you are prudent to do it early because it provides quality of life. They don't choke. They don't get aspiration. It's, it's a psychological thing. You don't want to see your loved ones in with a peg tube, but sometimes the peg tube actually makes the loved ones be more comfortable and have a better quality of life. If that's presented to the patient and the family much better, it actually really helps. I also think um, that also it requires the family to understand that sometimes the PEG tube has to be stopped at some point. It's like, it's like a, really a therapy for everybody to figure out where we're going, what's the dignity of life, what are our goals, not just sort of postpone the real discussion to the very end, but understand where we're going. I think patients find it extremely helpful. Um, to know like what can they expect, and they make plans. I mean, how people we knew what the disease was, and they said, you know, you don't have that much to live. They went and they traveled the world and had the best time of their life because the doctor told them they should do it now, and then they got really sick and they were grateful. They said, I, at least I did what I wanted to do. These are things that, um, people don't really think about often, and I think one has to be open about it and give them. Uh, not so fortunate news sometimes in a good way because you make the best out of it. A lot of people shy away from from bad news and nobody wants to talk about it. And in the end, people all regret that because time doesn't come back. These people went, they traveled the world, and then he got worse after six months into it. And he did it, and he said, that was the best time of his life. I'll never forget that. So something to think about. Also, wheelchair. I had a case where the patient... <laughs> was very stubborn, was a male, <laughs> and he didn't want to go on wheelchair, and he was falling over the place. And he said, why? I said, well, because I will lose independence. I'm like, no, you're going to gain independence. We put him in the wheelchair, and because of that, he could go with his wife to a concert, which he before couldn't. He's like, that's great. Now she's driving me around, and I can do things again. So you have to look at the big picture. Maybe he cannot walk, but he can go somewhere where he otherwise couldn't. So they started having more activities with him being in the wheelchair which was very bizarre to him, but made a lot of sense. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, 
Yeah, the, the point is um, the frequency of aspirations in, in a clinical trial study has not been shown to be changed. But the everyday choking, the little things, the problems of feeding, the, and the, the fear of eating, all that kind of stuff is terrible. I mean, I cannot imagine if I wouldn't be able to swallow what I had to go through. If it goes through here, I had peace. You can still try both, but the nutrition's there. We had a dietitian here. At least he get, she, he, the patient gets the calories. He's not depending on the terrible ordeal of swallowing some food to keep himself alive. It's in there, and he can, un, under low, much less stress, maybe have some additional food. You can combine it. But it's sort of a help to say you've got to use the help that we can give you. I know it's uncomfortable for you. I mean, nobody wants to have a tube in their, in their gut, you know, but sometimes it is what it is, and it, it, in long term it does help. So uh, education hope is important. I mean, physicians should also be open to alternative medical approaches. I tell my patients they should do anything they want as long as not harmful to them. And I do have some um, uh, doubts about all these uh, interesting things that we hear in clinic. Uh, I had a whole, it, it's every six months is different flavor but comes out in the news. And I find a lot of places um, kind of take advantage of the desperation of patients. I mean, I've had people spend $50,000 in China for stem cells that went into the blood. They never breached the blood-brain barrier. They'll never be in the brain, but they paid $50,000 for it to hope that they can help. And they never told us, I'm like, you know, you would probably be better off traveling the world with your spouse. Um, so I always say you can do it if it's not expensive. And usually those miracle trials, um, they're very expensive. So, if it's not expensive, try it. But if you have to pay a lot of money for this, I'll be sus uh, suspicious. Um, anyhow, um, and also I think it's important to continue follow-up appointments. I think there's a lot of fear of abandonment. And if, if a doctor can't provide a cure or can't provide a medication and sees that he can't do much more anymore, just being there for someone means a lot to patients. And so we make a big case of like, we continue the regularity of seeing each other, that the daily routine and the, the routine relationship continues. And I think it becomes a very uh, beautiful experience because people and patients really appreciate that. So I um, have a few more minutes. Uh, we Maybe. need to uh, yeah. wrap it up. We take one more question and we're gonna, we really need to take okay. a five minute break and then for the next okay, uh, speaker. If you don't mind, so. I'll skip a few slides. I just want to show something at, uh, for two minutes. There's a uh, diagnosis research going on on NMSA, which is quite exciting, that there are some early changes in the putamen, the structure in the basal ganglia, which actually here shows sort of a tailoring out on specific sequences. And we hope that we see this before the patient gets a full-blown MSA. And um, we are trying to publish this, actually, and we'll see if that turns out to be true, that we have some imaging changes that may help to uh, help uh, find earlier stages of MSA before they become clinically apparent. And one more thing I wanted to show, I don't have it in a video, but this is an interesting case where a patient had a massive camptochromia here, bent over and had a massive surgery and really got straightened out. Um, so there's some really um, trials which are not regular, but someone walks like this and then she was walking like that. It, it does help um, with surgery. And I have some slides I wanted to show you about stem cell research, basically um, uh, about oligodendrocytes and MSA. So um, I was actually involved in this as well. And what we've done is um, the idea is to take hair follicles or fibroblast skin cells and transform them into pluripotent stem cells. The same thing that was talked about yesterday for PSP. And we will differentiate them into oligodendrocytes. And the idea is to have an MSA oligodendrocyte culture and a controlled patient oligodendrocyte culture. And hope that the MSA oligodendrocyte culture dies earlier, just like in the disease. And then see if, if there's a difference, if we can throw a lot of drugs on it to reverse the process. But I'm very um, cautious about the idea because it's just one cell type, and as I told you, the neurons die as well, and we can't test that. But these are sort of exciting times to see if, at least in a human context, these are human cells, we can do something about it, at least learn from it. These are stainings I did to show that they're actually oligodendrocytes. 
And then um, I guess we'll skip all the rest. Uh, these are the whole trials. We talked about this in the earlier lectures anyways, about most of the PSP and MSA trials. All right, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gupta.